Our scripture this morning is from Matthew 10, 40 through 42. Please stand as you are able and listen now for the word of the Lord. Those who receive you are also receiving me, and those who receive me are receiving the one who sent me. Those who receive a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Those who receive a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. I assure you that everybody who gives even a cup of cold water to these little ones because they are my disciples will certainly be rewarded. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, over the past year and a half or so, we've started adding that into our tradition and our worship here in Threshold. When we read from the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we stand because it comes from an ancient tradition where when you're reading from those words of Christ, we want to be welcoming the very presence of Christ in our midst. And I think that's a wonderful thing that we stand to welcome the presence of Christ today as we talk about what it means to be people who are welcoming, who receive the very presence of God in our neighbors when they come to our door. So that's where we're going to be going today. Before we dive in, let's pray together. God of love and God of grace, this is your time and we are your people. Open our hearts, our minds, and our lives to your presence that we would hear your word and respond with all that we are. Amen. This is the first week in these conversations around field notes where We want to be paying attention over the summer as we're traveling on vacations or camps or all these places, acknowledging that God is out and moving in our world. And where maybe as we report back from the field, do we experience that presence of God moving? Those are some of the themes of the conversations. And each week we're going to be looking at these different uh, teachings of Christ. This teaching comes from the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount that my friend and colleague, Reverend Joe Stobaugh, preached about last week as he really summed up what it means for the Sermon on the Mount to be this foundational text, to be truly that foundation for our lives, for Christ to be the center of our lives on, and how do we build our lives around that foundation of Christ's teaching. And today, these are some of the final words that Christ offers his disciples. He's been teaching, and now he wants to send them out to teach. And he's hoping that in their coming and going that they may offer the same hospitality that they received as well. Those first disciples of Jesus were on the road. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any income. They lived in complete need for other people to welcome them, to give them a roof over their heads, to give them food to eat. And Christ is helping them to remember that sense of hospitality they have received, but to extend it further. I think about that just personally a lot, about what it means to receive hospitality from others. It's something that has deeply shaped who I am as a person. So I lived in three or four places growing up. Some of you in this room may have lived in less than that or have moved way more than that. But in the last 30 years of my life, I've lived in seven or eight different cities or towns. And I find myself deeply grateful for those who welcome me in. Whether it was my next door neighbor, Kurt, when I was five years old, who became a best friend that we would tear up the neighborhood in our big wheels and eat his mom's Reese's peanut butter cups that she tried to hide from us. I was deeply thankful of a best friend who would come along and invite me into his life and give me a place to belong. Or whenever my family moved to Palestine, Texas a few years later, and a friend of mine named Cliff was in my class and let me do work at the same table as him, who was the first person to invite me over to his house to spend the night, who became this lifelong friend for me, really helping me have a place to belong. Or in high school, whenever I had that experience of moving about two weeks before school started, and I was in drumline, I was a band kid. If you're in any kind of sports or activity like that, you know that uh, particularly football, a band, drill team, you have that week or two right before school where you're practicing, rehearsing, doing drills, all these things. I showed up, fish out of water, new kid, and this guy, JP, comes up to me and says, hey, you're new here, aren't you? Why don't you come eat with us today at lunch when we all break today? Why don't you sit with me on the bus when we travel for away games? Why don't you come and join my group of friends? And if anyone remembers their freshman year of high school, having a friend like that was really, really helpful, particularly being the new kid in town. And I have friends like that 
in college or whenever Alyssa and I have moved to Nashville or back here, people who leave those imprints on you because they welcomed you, because they made a space in their lives for me. It has made such a big difference in my life. Now, I look around our church and I know there are stories just like that for every single adult here, I'm guessing. We have maybe a handful of people in our church. We got a couple thousand members of our church, a little more than that. We only have a handful of adults who were actually born and raised in Frisco. Now, yeah, my daughter was born here. Maybe a lot of your kids were born in this area. But in terms of the adults in our community, <clears throat> almost everybody's from somewhere else. We may be experts about what it means to be welcomed and to welcome others in this room. Really, we may be. As I'm sure in those stories of people who welcomed me, you may have had someone come to your mind who was that neighbor who welcomed you to check in or give you some food when you moved in. Who, who was that coworker when you started a new job who came to make sure you were doing all right and became your work pal or whatever. Or maybe it's someone in this church who made you feel at home here at Grace Avenue. We, so many of us here, are experts at this experience of what it means to be new and receive hospitality and hopefully are experts in what it means to offer hospitality. Those relationships are so vital. They give us life. They make us feel like the risks are worth it. The risks of moving over to some new town and starting over, taking a new job, taking a new chance, trying to join some new faith community. Those relationships help us know that we're loved, that we're valued, that the risk was worth it. I think from our own experience, like I said, we are the experts here. I don't know that there's anything new I can tell you about welcoming people. In fact, I bet I could learn from a lot of you about what it means to welcome people. This is not a day where maybe you're going to find some new bright epiphany about how to live and follow Christ in the world. And that's okay. The faith tradition is long and has been here before me and we're here after me. My job is not to be about helping discover the new. But maybe our work today is to figure out how we remember well. That's the encouragement that Christ is offering his followers. Can you remember what it was like to receive hospitality, to be welcomed? And when you remember that and you remember how transformative that was for you, can you extend that sense further for more and more people? That's the invitation. Can we remember it well and can we extend it further? Man, what a great day to celebrate Holy Communion. It's down here. We're going to celebrate that later. That is the heart of the communion experience. We remember how we are welcomed and loved deeply by God. And we go from the table to extend that love and that welcome further. So Jesus is gathered with his friends. He's teaching his friends on this mountainside. And he is helping them remember. People welcomed us in their homes along the way, friends. They fed us at their tables. As you go out to teach and to serve, Go and do the same. When the prophet comes knocking on your door, when the righteous person comes looking for a place to crash, when one of the least of these, these little ones, as it said in our scripture, comes needing a cold cup of water, remember to receive them and welcome them. It says you'll be given a reward. I don't know that that means that God's necessarily going to make your house bigger or your bank account grow, but I know that I have been deeply rewarded whenever I have been welcomed and welcomed others by the very presence of God knowing that there is some deep connection that we will share in those moments, even if it is just a one chance experience of welcoming someone. We welcome the very presence of God. As some of the scriptures say, we never know when we're entertaining angels. Or Christ says, when two or more are gathered in my name, there I am among you. We are welcoming God's spirit when we welcome our neighbors. There are some folks who think the early church needed this reminder. You know, these words from Matthew's gospel weren't written down until maybe 70 years after Jesus said them. So you had a couple of generations of Christians living after those first disciples. And some people think the gospel's author was giving the early church an encouragement. Hey, remember those first disciples. Remember how they had to be welcomed along their way. Remember when you joined this faith, how you have been welcomed along the way. Christianity was a new movement. A lot of family members thought that their children were crazy for joining this new religious movement. They were, under, they were misunderstood. They were outcast. So many folks in the early church movement did not have wealth, did not have money. They had to survive on the hospitality of others. 
And Matthew's gospel is reminding the early church, remember, you were welcomed. Welcome others. Remember what it was like when someone opened their home to you and offered food to you and offered you that cold cup of water on a hot day. Remember and extend it further. It isn't just the early church that's being reminded of what it was like to follow Jesus. This is an echo of the entire faith tradition dating all the way back to Genesis when Abraham and Sarah were first called by God to leave their homeland and worship God and start what we know as the Jewish faith. Our faith is rooted in people who are migrants, who live off the hospitality of others, who are strangers in foreign lands, in foreign cultures, in foreign religions. And we are reminded in hundreds of verses throughout Scripture of this heritage that we carry. We are reminded over and over again that your ancestors were wanderers and were welcomed in by others, and so we too must extend that welcome. That is the character of God about welcome and grace and hospitality. Will we extend the same grace that we were offered? Will we extend the same grace that our ancestors were offered? We remember that we didn't just wake up one day and have all of the stuff that we have, but someone else has helped provide the living that we enjoy. That's the encouragement. I have a quote here from... Uh, some of my reading this week, William Goetler, who is one of these theologians, really summed it up nicely, I think. Uh, This is what he says to us. Jesus arrives today in the midst of all that we're doing, in the midst of our weekend plans, in in the midst of our Sunday morning routine. Jesus arrives today and tells us, take that love for your family, that love for your closest community, and extend it, extend it further and further still. Welcome in the stranger. Welcome in the one who's life you hardly understand, not to change them, but simply because they too are gods. Simply because they too are gods. I want to leave this up there for us to reflect on this. Here in Frisco, we are experts in what it means to be welcomed. I think from time to time, I find myself tempted to enjoy the comforts of a community like ours to enjoy my home as a refuge from the world outside or see my church home as a refuge and a fortress from the world beyond. But Christ reminds me today that the blessings I have are not just for my own benefit, but that I am called, it is a characteristic part of our faith to make sure that all I encounter can experience the same hospitality and blessing that I have been given. I think this is a good quote for us to think about in the midst of where our country is right now. We are going to celebrate Independence Day this week. It's a time for us to remember where we come from as a country. And I hope we remember well, as we prayed earlier, yes, the the great sacrifice that has been made for us to enjoy the blessing that we have, but also the many different stories that shape our America. It isn't just one homogenous group of people. We are a diverse group of folks who come from all over the world, all different cultures, all different backgrounds, and we come together. The love that we have for the family, for those closest to us, those most like us cannot be held within us if we hope for our country to be a truly great place. As we celebrate our independence this weekend and our freedoms this weekend, I hope that we take seriously the diversity that has shaped us to be people of great generosity and hospitality, particularly for those that we can hardly understand and not to change them. I think that's a hard thing in our American discourse right now. We really, really want to change a lot of minds to agree with wherever I happen to be standing right now. And so much of that, I think, is in this misunderstanding piece. I don't understand where you are, but if you could just stand where I am, we could understand each other, please. Thank you. If you could just see it my way, come on. But no, it's, it's not to change, but to truly be in a relationship because they too are gods. That's something I hope we remember this Independence Day. Our story is rich and it's complex. It is complex. America is not a story of homogenous unity from day one. 
We had religious differences across the colonies. We had folks brought here by force from other countries. We've had a nation and history of immigrants coming from across the world seeking to make a new start. What does it mean for us to welcome in the stranger in the same way that some of us were welcomed or had to fight to be welcomed? It's good to hold all of this intention and hope that we can move to a better place of welcome, I hope. We can clear that out now. Uh, we'll post that quote later on online as well and probably with that prayer that we had in the back of the room. For a place like us, for a church like ours, for a community like ours, in the midst of where our country is right now, where our communities are right now, can we begin with remembering the joy of being welcomed? I ask this of myself, what would it look like for me to engage with someone I disagree with by remembering first how I have been welcomed and loved before trying to engage over some controversial topic or some place where we deeply disagree? Would I offer the person who I disagree most would I offer them the same hospitality that someone else has given me? And what would that look like? Can you imagine a healthcare debate in this country starting from a place of compassion and empathy from ways that I have been provided for or others have been provided for? May my neighbor be provided for and welcomed as well. Not that we have to understand each other or agree with each other on these things, but can we have the discourse from a place of mutual welcome and hospitality? That's my hope in terms of marriage equality in our country. Two years ago, there were celebrations because marriage equality became the law of the land, and the United Methodist Church is still divided on this. And this week, the Texas Supreme Court had a decision that in the state of Texas that there are limits to how benefits get distributed. And many of my friends are heartbroken over that and wondering what the church has to say and who's welcome. My hope is, no matter if we agree or disagree, that we have a character of welcome because whether or not I understand someone else's situation or identity or experience in the world, they too are God's. They are God's child. And God welcomes and loves them completely. And may the church be a reflection of that. I know our church hopes to be a reflection of that. I know our church is deeply wanting to be a reflection of that as we engage what it means to welcome immigrants and refugees in our country. Uh, as we wonder about what are the best policies, whether it's to make sure everyone has complete legal documentation or comes from the right countries? What does it mean for us to remember that we have a heritage of people who are strangers and immigrants and foreigners and offer hospitality like our ancestors were offered hospitality? It may not have the same understanding as our legal system. It may not have the same sense of what the debate ought to be about, but can we begin the conversations from a place of seeing each other as gods first? that we all belong to God first before anything else. This is something that I struggle with as a Christian and a pastor in our country. Where do the tenets of my faith take priority over the call of a political party or being a citizen of our country with all of the privileges that I'm so thankful for there? Where will I welcome someone as a Christian first before thinking of myself as an American? Do I see myself and my neighbor as uh, children of God before seeing what country we were born in? That we all get thirsty and need a cold cup of water. That we all get tired and need a place to sleep. That we all get hungry and need a place to eat. No matter if we understand one another, no matter if we share the same gender, ethnicity, country of origin, that we all belong to God first and seek to foster that way of being. In the midst of all the things that we remember from the last couple of years, I'm deeply struck with a Christian example of hospitality that still shakes me to my core. Mid-June in 2015, there was a Bible study going on at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. It's an AME church, an African Methodist Episcopal church, and they have a deep, deep history of advocating for civil rights in our country. 
And on an ordinary day with an ordinary Bible study at this African-American church, a young white man showed up who didn't have the same experience, didn't have the same understanding, but was welcomed in completely by this Bible study group. A, a tragedy happened where he chose to act out of anger and fear and racism and decided that people would die that day. And it was awful. But the story does not end with the act of violence or the act of hatred or the act of fear in the face of hospitality. Victims of those folks who lost their lives, members of that church said, you were welcome to come to study with us and they continued to offer a welcoming presence of love for this guy, Dylan Roof, over and over and over again. Our legal system sentenced him to death, but these members of this church went to visit this man in prison, and they went over and over again to offer forgiveness, and they even advocated the courts to not rob him of a chance of redemption and grace, because that would not reflect the character of God continually welcoming it was interesting in some of his testimony, he even said they were so welcoming to him that he almost didn't go through with it. And they continued to show that love over and over again across misunderstanding, across pain, across risk. I am deeply, deeply troubled wondering if I remember well being welcomed and if I would be willing to risk that kind of hospitality in the face of someone who would do me harm, someone who only fears me, someone who would hate me, that I would reflect Christ so well as those members and leaders of the Mother Emanuel AME Church. Maybe every single moment for you is not a life and death moment of how you offer welcome. But every single moment is an opportunity. And every single moment is an opportunity to receive the grace of God and offer the grace of God for our neighbors. So I want to dream about Frisco being this kind of place. We are experts at hospitality. We are experts of what this means to be welcomed and to welcome others. What does it mean for us to live that out and for our communities to be a beacon of hospitality in a culture of fear and division and anger? I think about all the homes in our community that have pristine, decorated by almost like they were Joanna Gaines herself, guest bedrooms, that so often go unused unless we got family in town? What would it look like for every guest bedroom in Frisco to be filled with someone who needed a place to sleep and have shelter? What would it look like for our beautiful kitchen tables that we either get from Nebraska Furniture Mart or Lord help us, Ikea or wherever, that so often will get unused because we are so busy and we don't have time to be with one another? If they were filled with welcoming our neighbors and we were sharing stories and food together, Engaging a cross where we don't understand each other always, but we see that we all belong to God first. And we would remember well what it means to be welcomed, and we would extend that welcome further. What would it look like if you took a little bit of time out of your week and saw that there was someone asking for a cold cup of water and you gave them a lunch as well with Frisco Family Services or with our neighbors down in Little Elm? Each of those moments is an opportunity. That's the hope I pray for us. When we come later to share around this table, would we remember well what it means to be welcomed? And would we extend that welcome across our divisions, across our disagreements, across our misunderstandings, to see that we all belong to God first? Amen.